Welcome to our second educational forum from the League of Women Voters of Fresno that is hosting it on agriculture. Our last forum focused on economic health. If you missed the forum, you can find the link on our, the League website. Today's forum will focus on animal management and food safety. Our local league is participating in a national league study on agriculture, and in preparation of our study, we are hosting these forums for the community. My name is Jackie Canfield, and I'm a proud member of the League of Women Voters. The League is a nonpartisan organization, which means we do not endorse or oppose any candidates. But we do believe strongly in studying issues and when we have consensus, take action to make a difference in our community. We also believe strongly that the public should hear different views on issues facing our communities in order for them to make an informed decision. Again, as mentioned, today's forum will focus on food safety and animal management. We will hear from a panel of experts. After we hear from our panel, you will have the opportunity to ask our panel member questions. And that's after all members have spoken. Our panel today includes Bill Griffin, who is a supervisor of Fresno County Department of Agriculture and Pesticide Use Enforcement Division. We have Cheryl McLaughlin, a bovine veterinarian, which she will make sure you all understand what that is before she gets done talking, and Kyle Smith, who is an urban farmer. In addition, we have Doug Patterson, who is a water control, control engineer, who will be available to answer questions from the audience later in this program. So as mentioned, we're going to start off with Bill Griffin, and let me give you a little bit of background about him. He is a Fredo, Fresno native who has graduated from Fresno State with a bachelor's degree in production agriculture. He's been working with Fresno County Ag Agriculture Office since 1999 and is currently the supervisor of the Pesticide Use Enforcement Division. After working in Fres uh, Fireball, Mendota area for six years, he transferred to Reedley Orange Cove District. The Pesticide Office issues pesticide application permits, reviews, and corrects use reports and answers questions from our egg community. And so Bill is going to give us a little bit more background than that and hopefully we'll understand what all he needs to do for us to keep us safe. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Hey, there we go. <clears throat> Good morning, my name is Bill Griffin, Fresno County Department of Agriculture Ag Commissioner's Office. Uh, we are the, your county agency for ag-related uh, activities. We are an enforcement agency. Um, a lot of people call us for questions of all types dealing with agriculture, like this morning we got a phone call about uh, what to do with treated grape steaks. And we don't do anything with that, but we can help you find out what you would do with something like that. So we're a resource for the ag community, but we're also a resource for the general, the community in general, Fresno County, um, and even the state. We, we work uh, statewide sometimes. So what I thought I would do is initially just kind of do a little quick background on what the commissioner's office does and specifically what the pesticide division does. Um, so you kind of get a little better idea what our office is all about. So, pesticide division, that's specifically what I deal with. Um, we work, obviously we deal with pesticides. We also work with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Like I said, we're the county level, we're the boots on the ground. We also work the Department of Pesticide Regulation, which is a subdivision of California Department of Food and Ag. So they're the state level. They're our parent in this, in this community, in this chain. So it's us, DPR, CDFA, California Department of Food and Ag, and then the federal level is the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. We have developed a partnership between us and Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, DPR oversees the county ag commissioner system. Every county in the state has an ag commissioner. We interpret or direct, they interpret and direct rules and regulations, uh, how we implement them in the, in the state, in the county. 
We enforce the California Ag Code and the Code of Regulations. Like I said, we're a resource. Uh, we, big part of our job is we create a lot of data. Um, we do data on use reporting, uh, pesticide illnesses. We also collect data on uh, for the what's called the farm or at farm report um, that's done every year. That's a compilation of what was used in the county, uh, what was grown, and the value of those crops. Um, we also facilitate pesticide container recycling. When growers use up materials, they triple rinse their containers, and what do they do with them after that? We help them get recycled so they're not sent into the landfill. Uh, continuing education, we help people who have licensing through our department or through the state get their continuing education hours. Uh, state licensing, we help with that. Everyday use forms, such as pesticide use reports. Uh, compliance assistance, we work with growers, we work with all kinds of applicators to make sure that their employers, employees are safe and handling pesticides properly. And we also can deal with hazardous material issues. Once again, we do a lot of data. Um, every time somebody makes an application of pesticides in the state of California, they have to turn in a use report. This is for production agriculture. So every time somebody makes an application to their almonds, peaches, grapes, they have to turn in a report. And we can uh, review that report, make sure that everything was applied was legal, and then we turn that report into the state. Um, specify, has specifics about the pesticide application, how was it done, uh, what crop was it done to, what rate of material did they use. That kind of creates this big data ball that uh, the state helps, helps them making decisions on what materials they can keep and use in the future. And it helps us develop trends, you know, what materials are increasing, what materials are decreasing. Uh, currently, we're seeing a lot of the older chemistry that's been around basically post-World War II is declining. That's a lot of the more toxic materials. The newer chemistries that are coming out are more common. They're often a lot easier on the environment. They're also a lot easier on the beneficials that we want to keep. A lot of the insects that we want to stay in your orchard, vineyard, that sort of thing. So not every pesticide is designed to scorch earth. It's designed to help keep some material, keep the good beneficials around and get rid of the bad ones. Uh, we keep a three year, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah, just a term. You mentioned production agriculture. Yes. Are you familiar with that? What is that opposed Production to? agriculture is the, is the growth of a crop for sale. And what other kind of there's called non-production ag or non-ag. Those are, for example, uh, non-production ag would be um, soccer fields or use around um, areas like golf courses. There's pesticides that are applied to those situations, but that crop is not harvested or that, that area is not created for sale. You know, we enjoy being able to go out and play on a golf course and be, you know, reduce the amount of weeds and that kind of thing, so it has a nice green course, but we don't eat the crop. We don't go out there and consume the, the turf. That's considered agriculture? It's still considered ag, it's just not production ag. Production ag has to do with something that is actually consumed by someone else. Is that ringing bothering you guys? Let me see if I can do it without feeding back real bad. Hold on just a quick second. I might be turning it up. Let's start a little lower and go back up. How's that? Let's go a little more. How's that? He's not ringing anymore? All right, good. Apologize for that. I was like, it's driving me nuts. It's got to be making you people crazy. Okay. Um, so does that answer your question? You know, there are multiple uses that we keep track of. Production agriculture is the stuff that we, like I said, we make sure that uh, is when someone makes an application to their cantaloupes, their almonds, they have to turn in a report to the state stating what they did and how they did it. There's non-production agriculture where they still have to turn in what they did, but it's not done 
in a manner that uh, they don't have to be site specific. Means that, you know, if they do a golf course, they just tell us it was done on turf. Um, it's a little more general, but we still do get that information. We do know how much they applied. And then there's what's called non-agricultural use, which is structural fumigations, such as when they come out and tent a house for termites. That's still pesticide use, and it's still reported, and we still regulate it, but it's non-production. They, but they still have to turn in a use report for that use. So there is a big, there's different categories when it comes to pesticide use. This is a fact I always like throwing out. What do you guys think, answer or not, what do you guys think is the number one pesticide in at least California, if not the United States? Good answer. It is a pesticide. I'll explain why. Um, the number one pesticide used in California, if not the entire world, detergent or chlorine. Number one. What's the number one product that we get the most complaints on? Chlorine and chlorine bleach. We have more incidences on use and misuse of chlorine and chlorine bleach than we do any other product that we deal with. Okay? How many ranchers use chlorine or growers? Very, very, very few because there's no registered products for it. They might use it for cleaning equipment, but that would be it. It's mostly homeowner and industrial use. So. Just a little factoid that I throw out there. Um, so, but as far as, you know, Roundup or glyphosate is a very, very popular product, not only in the homeowner sector, but in the agricultural sector. Um, just a definition that some people get confused with. Pesticides is the umbrella for everything that kills something else. So herbicide kills herbaceous plants. Uh, insecticides kill insects, fungicides kill fungus, bactericides kill bacteria. They are all considered pesticides. A lot of people think pesticides, they think bug automatically. And that's a real common. Um, just so from a definition standpoint, when I say pesticides, that covers everything, not just uh, insects specifically, okay? And if you have any questions, please shout them out because I love answering questions. It helps get us good information. Uh, let's go on to the next one here. Um, just a little bit about container recycling. We do develop a program to help folks uh, when they've used up their pesticide containers and they've been properly rinsed out, that we help them recycle them. They turn them into plastic bags. They turn them into uh, all kinds of products that are used in the plastic industry. So they recycle them. They don't all just go in the, in the landfill. Um, although we do the recycling at the landfill area, just in case some of those products might have still, still in them when they're, they're loading them into the shredder that, that shreds them up and turns them into mulch uh, for your later use. But that's why we do it out there. So if you ever happen to be by the American landfill, I'm sure it's a very popular tourist attraction. Um, that's why we're out there as we recycle them in their facility. We also do employee safety training. We help em uh, employers make sure their handlers are kept safe. Um, how to handle pesticides properly, uh, what to do in case of emergency, what to do if they feel sick. Um, so there's, you know, we do help uh, growers and users of all sorts if they have any uh, concerns, questions, and we help them keep them in compliance with uh, the rules and regulations of the state and the EPA. Uh, we cover personal protective equipment, making sure they know how to use that properly. Uh, application techniques, decontamination, uh, transportation, uh, storage, disposal, all that kind of information. Uh, what we call continuing education, uh, food and ag code laws, we make sure that everyone, uh, in order to maintain their application licenses, we make sure they get their continuing education, so we give them new information. And I can run without the mic if it's okay, I'll just use this one. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty loud anyways. Um, so food and ag code, we make sure they're in compliance with food and ag code. Uh, current new and technology, we want to make sure that everybody's aware of what they have to use or would like to use, make sure it's a registered use and available. Uh, Multi-agent compliance, we deal with a lot of different agencies, EPA I've stated, California Department of Food and Ag, um, anybody that uses a pesticide in any shape or form, we 
are involved in one way or another. So we work everywhere from your actual grower, uh, we work with landscape guys, we work with structural applicators, everybody who uses a pesticide, we're usually involved with them in one form or another. Um, and we often do a lot of this without any fee, other than the lunch, which was delicious. Uh, and then we also do online continuing education to help uh, people get, continue to get their education so they can maintain their licensing. Um, just a quick word on application types, structural, pest control operators, the guy that comes and does your uh, spiders and creepy crawlies you don't want around your house. Uh, pilots, guys who put stuff on through the air, they're licensed, they have to maintain their hours. Uh, pest control advisors or PCAs, they're very, very common in our valley. They're people who write recommendations for growers so that they can do what they need to do on their crops. They help advise growers to do pesticide use and do it properly. Maintenance gardeners, these are the guys that will mow your lawn. Occasionally they do a little bit of roundup work or spray work to help maintain your, your garden area. Those guys are licensed too or they should be. Uh, pesticide dealers and brokers, those are all people that need to be inspected. We, we, California is probably the most regulated, if not my opinion, it is the most regulated pesticide applicator state in, the, in California, in the United States, if not the world. Uh, we also deal with what happens if there's a complaint. Uh, we've had a couple complaints the last couple days where people were very concerned about what was happening around them. We field those complaints and we respond to every single one of them. Even ones that maybe don't directly relate to us, if we can't solve it or it's not directly our department, we make sure we get it to the folks that do. Production ag use reporting, like I said, every ag use requires a use report. We make sure those are turned in, turned in properly and all the information is correct. Uh, monthly summary use, notice of intent. Anybody wants to do a California restricted material, which is specific to uh, a spray permit that we issue to every applicator. They have to turn in a notice of intent 24 hours before that use where we can go out and look at that application prior to use to see if there's any mitigating measures that might need to be done and make sure that we, uh, everything is safe and we avoid any potential hazards. Hazardous materials, once again, uh, spills, leaks, fires. We're not necessarily the first responders, usually fire, paramedic, that kind of thing come out first but we are involved in those situations. We come out and make sure, hey, was the applicator at fault? Was there some other reason? Uh, why, why did this accident happen? You know, was it avoidable? How can we fix it? Make sure it doesn't happen to someone else in the future. Once again, Department of Pesticide Regulation, they are our cooperators in this. We are the boots on the ground. They are the ones at next level up. Um, we can reference them questions that we have, uh, public questions, what do we do about bugs, weeds, and other pests. DPR has a lot of information on that subject. Uh, laws and regs, schools, what to do in school pest control. Um, they often create multilingual information for our Spanish speakers, Punjab, Punjabi speakers. We try and create uh, information for those that are non-English speakers. Uh, food safety, grants for research, employee safety training, and statewide pesticide use statistics. Um, they are the hub for where all of this information goes to, and then they can sort it out and have it available. It's public information. Anyone can find it and ask for it. And then this probably affects, this is where we really hit the road, is keeping our surface water safe. We've recently had some new materials that have been, restrictions have been put on them as far as applications near surface water. These are waters that drain off of properties and then drain into rivers and streams. We want to make sure that some of these materials don't show up in our rivers, streams, and groundwater. Uh, once groundwater right after that, we make sure that, you know, there's some areas in our, in our area that are very sandy. And there's some materials that like to just shoot right through that sand and get right down into the groundwater, and we don't want that to happen. So we mitigate how some of those materials are used to keep them out of our groundwater. Um, the air we breathe, obviously, 
We live in a bowl, sometimes people call it. It's an area where sometimes pesticides can get used and they just stay here. They don't move away. We have to be careful how we use materials. That's our job is to make sure the materials are used properly. Um, and we educate growers how to use them properly. We want to keep the food we eat safe. I believe we have the safest food in the world. Um, we do a very good job. Our growers do an excellent job of using insecticides, pesticides properly. And then we also promote working relationships, not only with growers, but with the community and make sure that everyone is, gets the information they need. Uh, we work in, with environmental justice groups. Uh, we make sure that we have our ear to them and them to us. So we all kind of get the information disseminated the proper way. Can I answer any questions? Yes. I was interested that you were saying that older chemistry as you yes. Mm -hmm. uh, pesticides are in the decline of yes. the ones that were developed out of bomb material after World War II yes. are petrochemical. Mm -hmm. um, the newer chemistry, are they also petrochemical, pe uh, petroleum derivatives or something? No, else? no. They've gotten far more into what we call uh, IGRs or okay. growth regulators. So they, they work with on the chemistry of the critter itself. Um, they also, we, there's a lot of advancement in finding natural or uh, environmental uh, materials that will slow or reduce pesticide or uh, uh, the, the pests, um, such as, uh, oh, like mint oils and using derivatives of plants that insects naturally don't like. So there's been more use of that, especially in the structural industry around your homes. There's been more use of materials that are very low toxicity, but the little creepy crawlies don't like it. So they stay away, they move away. May not kill them, but it's a very good avoidance materials. Um, we also do a lot of what's called uh, integrated pest management or IPM, where maybe we use some of, that, some of these new materials, but we find out we reduce our amount of applications by finding out when's the optimum time to treat. So we're not just spray by the calendar, some people call it, where you just spray, spray, spray every two weeks. You know, we, we work to make sure that these materials are applied in a proper way. What is the source? Okay, of we'll hold all the questions until the end now. Okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Bill. Cool. Our next speaker is uh, Charlene McLaughlin. She is a doctor of veterinary medicine and is the direct, uh, district sales manager for Lanco Animal Health Dairy Strategic Account Team. She received her degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I know there's more than one now, I looked that up. Charlene was uh, uh, majored in uh, I'm sorry, Charlene was a large animal veterinarian practice in Wisconsin. She also worked as a technical sales specialist in Monsanto, Monsanto, which is a sustainable agricultural company, has a very interesting website and mission statement. You might want to look that up. And she has been a coach and manager for 11 years in the Central Valley for California. She has taught numerous courses in animal science and dairy production department at Fox Valley Technical College in Appleton, Wisconsin. She has been a guest lecturer at Cal Poly, University of Minnesota, and the University of Wisconsin. Charlene, you're going to help us learn about the dairy industry and uh, pharmaceutical uses of, uh, in animals. Well, great. I'm excited uh, to be here. I uh, could spend days talking about animal agriculture. I love animal agriculture. And um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about animal agriculture. So um, just for starters, how many of you grew up on a farm? Oh, good. So we've got, uh, we actually have more uh, 
more direct experience here than uh, the general population. I think um, there's less than 3% of the population involved in agriculture anymore, and so it's no wonder that people are very concerned about where does their food come from and how safe, um, how safe are, is the food that they're eating. Um, I agree with uh, Bill that uh, the United States has the safest food in the world. It's, it's uh, great that it's um, a testimony to how safe our food is when there's um, a big thing on the news around pet food being contaminated, um, you know, because human food isn't as much of a uh, newsworthy issue anymore because uh, because there is so much safety so that's a great thing so one of the things in talking to Diane we talked about a little bit about the background since what I really know about is the dairy industry I'm not involved in the swine poultry industry um, and not much in the beef industry so from the dairy industry is anybody seen in the grocery store uh, containers of milk that say um, no antibiotics used on this milk. So then uh, would you assume then the carton next to it that does just says milk, would you assume that there's antibiotics in that milk? That's what you'd assume. Um, so the truth is, is uh, the dairy industry um, you can be assured that 100% of the milk that's on those shelves does not have antibiotics in it. That when a um, truck leaves a dairy farm, a tanker load of milk, and it arrives at California Dairies Inc. or Producers Dairies Inc. or Land of Lakes or wherever, the, before they unload that truck, they take a sample of the milk and they run it into the lab and they test it. And if it came back positive, that milk is diverted, does not go into the food supply. The dairy producer who put that contaminated milk on there, the first time they make the mistake, they don't get paid for the milk, of course. They get a big penalty, and they get one strike against them. The third time that happens, they lose their license. They can't sell milk anymore, period. So they're out of business. So besides not getting paid for their milk, being concerned about losing their license to do business, that's a huge fine. What I see on the majority of dairies anymore is if an animal has to be treated with antibiotics, they have a separate pen, the animal goes into what's called a hospital pen, and the milk from that hospital pen those animals, it does not go into the tank. Um, and they're very, very careful about that. There's multiple systems on dairies to prevent that contamination. So it's kind of what we talk about HACCP with hazard, critical hazard control points is there's um, procedures on the farm to keep it from happening, but then with the manufacturer, the people who handle the milk, they've got their critical control point before the tanker even gets unloaded. So I think that's important. Yes? I guess I always assumed that what they meant by that labeling is that the cows were not fed antibiotics because, and that if it doesn't have that labeling, then the cows were fed antibiotics. So um, as far as whether the antibiotics are fed to the cow or injected into the cow or however, the, if, there would be if, if there would be antibiotics fed to the cows, that would be in the milk and that, um, then it would be tested and that would be, you know, that's what, that's what you care about is, is the milk contaminated with antibiotics. If the animal's treated with antibiotics, fed, injected, they're in that hospital pen. So you're saying that dairy cows are not fed antibiotics? Okay, so, all right, so, so all right, let's go, let's go into another issue. So um, what's an antibiotic? Does anybody know the definition of antibiotic? 
It's, it, an antibiotic is a substance made by a microorganism that kills other microorganisms. So there's, you know, obviously that's penicillin was the first discovered in uh, 1928 by Andrew Fleming. The um, first production of antibiotics was uh, in just after World War II, 1945, um, and was the product, production of penicillin. So the, the thing with, to your point, around antibiotics is there's different classes of antibiotics, so like penicillin. There's also a class of, that's technically an antibiotic called ionophores. And ionophore is a, not used in human medicine at all. And it um, works, they use it for uh, a protozoan in a cattle and in uh, poultry called um, coccidiosis. And so feeding ionophores to animals prevents coccidiosis. And so that is technically an antibiotic and they are fed to animals that are in the food system but there's, um, they've been gone through all the rigorous testing with the FDA. There's no residue in the milk. There's not a residue in the meat. So that, so technically to your point is, yes, there are ionophores fed to animals, um, and ionophores are technically antibiotics, but it doesn't get to this issue of antibiotic resistance or antibiotic contamination of the meat or the milk. So even if a carton said no antibiotics, the animal probably was fed antibiotics? Well, we'd have to look at the carton. And I, I don't have a, any of those cartons in front of me, so I, I don't want to say, I don't, I, I don't want to address that issue, because they, they say different things. But what I can tell you is 100% of the milk whether it's organic, whether it's labeled uh, antibiotic-free or not labeled antibiotic-free, it doesn't have antibiotics in it. So, okay? Um, and I've, I've got, you know, other information if you want. Now we can talk afterwards. So I think, yep. If, if we're, uh, everything is in confinement, turkeys, chickens, pigs, cows, uh, by the grapevine, I hear that they're fed a ration of antibiotics because they're in such confined quarters that if they don't do that, they're going to, uh, if something happens, they lose the whole herd or flock or whatever. And, uh, and, and it seems like you're telling us that uh, this stuff is safe and it's not going to affect their immune uh, systems or such. Uh, I'm confused. So there's a lot of, there's, there's a... You know, we should really hold questions to the All right. end. Okay, all right, all right, we'll, we'll hold questions at the end, but I will address your question. So I think, you know, one of the things is why is everybody concerned about antibiotics? The question posed before me was, um, which, of, which of the following approaches to food safety should government reform or fund? One was limit the use of antibiotics in animal production to treat and control disease. And so that's what I'm getting to. So I think one of the um, things that um, we should again talk about is the, um, the top antibiotics used in humans versus the antibiotics used in animals to this point of antibiotic resistance. So the number one antibiotic used in human medicine is 44% of penicillin, and the number one in animals is 41% of animal antibiotics is tetracycline. So the point there is, and, and then meanwhile in animals, only 6% of the antibiotics used is penicillin, and in humans only 4% tetracycline. So there's not much overlap there. And then back to what I said is uh, the number one antibiotic, number two antibiotic um, in fed to animals is this ionophore class, which has no bearing in human, human use at all. With the issue of antibiotic resistance, what's the issue there? It's hospitals, it's, um, 
extended care facilities, that's the number one thing we're concerned about. Uh, human medicine, we're concerned about um, Staph aureus, the MRSA, the resistant um, Staph aureus, that's not the issue in animal, in animal medicine. Um, let me just go over this. Um, in terms of uh, the, the FDA just came out with new guidance around the issue of antibiotics use in veterinary medicine. It just came out with a report in December. And so it addresses this issue that no longer, and it'll be in full force in three years, there'll no longer be antibiotics be able to use in production animal agriculture um, for, the, um, for just growth promotion. The, the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture will have to be to treat disease or prevent disease or control disease, but not used as a growth promotion. And there, that in, there's, they're really phasing out the overlap because of the concern about antibiotic resistance. They're phasing out the overlap between medicines that are important to humans and use in animal agriculture. So there's, in the last number of years, a number of products have been taken away from the poultry industry that are of importance in human medicine. And, and again, what we need is innovation um, around new kind of products that aren't antibiotics, vaccines, prevention type innovation so that um, you know, it's not an issue. And the thing is, is that antibiotic resistance goes both ways. That um, just as much as the resistance can go from animals to humans, it can go from humans to animals. And if you think about the number of people versus the number of animals, um, and, and it's, it's very likely going the other way, companion animals included, you know, how many of us um, have our pets in our beds anymore, in our bedrooms, um, that's a big deal. In human medicine, they're really working on the overuse, the overprescription of antibiotics, the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, there's a big symposium in Kansas City in November with the top people um, in the country from a veterinary standpoint and a medical standpoint looking at this whole issue of antibiotic resistance and um, it's a great paper, and I'll, I'll give uh, Diane a copy of it with a reference. You can go to the web you can go to the website and get that. But um, that's uh, so. So at any rate, um, let me uh, just keep going before we run out of things. So um, I think the uh, you know the 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 things that came out of that symposium is the science around the science around. Antibiotic resistance is complex. It goes both ways. It's in nature. So the one thing to think about, it happens in nature. So when we're on antibiotics and our um, waste products go down the toilet, um, does our treatment facilities, do, does that um, uh, inactivate those antibiotics? We don't, I don't know the answer to that. But once those antibiotics get into the environment, then there's a potential for resistance to happen. Um, and it's, Denmark did a, uh, in the 90s, Denmark banned all antibiotic use in, in animals and uh, resistance didn't change. Um, it, it was, it's actually a very interesting experiment of what would happen if we banned use of antibiotics in animal agriculture. And uh, the resistance didn't change and actually the use of antibiotics for treatment went up because there was more contamination, there were more sick animals. I think, um, you know, I'll just, I'm probably running low on time. How am I doing on time? What? I'm okay? All right. I think the big thing to your question is um, the, uh, in animal agriculture, animals are really expensive. So a dairy cow right now probably costs $1,500, right, Jerry? 
Um, so the animal costs $1,500. It takes the animal almost um, two and a half years before it enters the milking stream. So for the, for the dairy farmers to get the money back from raising that animal is a good three years. So what's the producer's number one goal? Keep that animal healthy, never let it get sick. The work that I do, the work that other veterinarians and nutritionists um, on, on the farms are doing is trying to keep the animals healthy so they never get sick. Because once that animal gets sick, goes in the hospital pen, gets treated with an antibiotic, there's no sale from the milk um, for usually at least 10 days to two weeks. Um, and so it's, it's very expensive, it costs time. And so what I see in production agriculture is, is the systems are around keeping animals healthy in the first place. And when I, when I worked in Wisconsin on dairy farms, I worked on dairy farms with 20 cows and I worked on dairy farms with 5,000 cows. And um, you know, just, just like everything else, there's good people that take really good care of animals and, and there's people who could do better. But I think the idea that a lot of the people in media have fostered is that these confinement operations are, are, are bad for the animals. It, if you just think about stress, is the enemy of growth and reproduction. And to have these animals prosper, they need to be growing in the case of meat animals, putting on weight, in the case of dairy animals, providing milk, um, getting pregnant again. All of those things, when an animal's stressed, that's the first thing to go. They're not gonna gain weight, they're not gonna reproduce, their amount of milk production is going to go down. So I look at milk as the gift. The better we take care of cows, the more milk we get. The, the best dairy farmers have the highest milk production because they're keeping those cows cool, they're keeping them clean, they're keeping them comfortable. They have a PhD nutritionist that does the ration for them. A lot of them have on-farm veterinarians. So. Um, can, can we keep doing better on farms? Absolutely. But the, uh, but the idea that it's a, a prison and a dungeon, um, I think the dairy farmers in California need to have more open houses uh, to invite people in to see that uh, those animals are, are prospering. And that's, it's tough to make a living in animal agriculture and if you're stressing your animals, you're going to be out of business. I guess that's the good news is if you're, if you're worried about people abusing their animals, they'll be out of business. So that'll take care of that. Um, but, you know, I think that the bottom line is what are we seeing around the world in terms of uh, um, civil unrest, whether it's Egypt, even what's going on in the Ukraine, um, it has a lot to do with food and is there going to be enough food for everybody to eat. And we know that by 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people in the world. Um, how are we going to feed them? There isn't more land. There's shrinking amount of land. And as people move into the middle class and in Indonesia and in Africa and in China, they're not happy just having rice and beans. They want more protein, animal protein in their diet. The first thing they look for is egg protein. Second thing is usually something around dairy. So we need to use technology. We need to take care of the environment. We need to have the bottom line sustainability to get productivity in a sustainable way to feed the world. And that's what how we're going to have peace in the world. So I think that's, that's for me the bottom line. So thanks for having me talk, and um, I'll pass the microphone to Kyle.
All right, Kyle Smith is going to be our next speaker, and Kyle has a Bachelor's of Arts in, ag uh, in Architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. He has 10 years experience in construction and architecture industries. In 2012, you're probably wondering where the farm part comes in. He helped uh, filing, find a Tower Urban Family Farm, or Tough, with his brothers. Tough Farms, vacant and underutilized land within Fresno's urban area. The produce is delivered directly to restaurants and is sold to the public through the neighborhood farm stand. Kyle Smith, as you can tell, has a passion for his community and human aspect on agri agri ag architecture. I keep thinking I was going to mess up, and I did. To that end, he has developed strong skills in community outreach and uh, partic participatory design. He is emerging as a community leader focusing on the issues of smart growth, homeless access to healthy food, and promoting quality design for the San Joaquin Valley health and economic vitality. And I'll hand it over to Kyle. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about both my family and uh, the farm that we started. This is the home that I grew up in uh, in the Tower District, South of Olive. Uh, we got it added to the historic registry, so I was super excited about that. That's an old horse hitch out front. Um, we've got a lot of neighborhoods in Fresno that are old and have been uh, unkept, and we've got a lot of uh, problems with concentrated poverty and food access. So um, our farm was kind of founded around that idea. Uh, this is a map of concentrated poverty in Fresno. That big red spot in the middle is downtown and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and kind of at the north end of that red spot is where I grew up. Um, Fresno has the, these issues of, of uh, lack of access to jobs, lack of access to healthy communities, um, and lack of access to food. And we're we're trying to uh, find a solution to get to that. Um, our current food system does not provide in the way that um, every household could have healthy food readily available to them. And so we're trying to do something to fix that. Uh, here, and it's a little part of it, and hopefully we can uh, make this spread into to a place where um, food security in Fresno is um, you know, is secure and is sustainable, and that no natural disaster will keep us from having our own food. Uh, this is a map of food access. Um, when you think of food access, think of your grocery store, think of anywhere, uh, uh, farmer's markets, anywhere where you could buy fresh food um, and um, your, your commodities. Um, let me go back real quick. Uh, so within the kind of core of Fresno and a lot of Southwest and Southeast Fresno, um, people don't live within two miles of a grocery store. What that means is that you cannot walk to a grocery store, uh, that you need a car to drive there. In many um, poor communities, they don't have access to a car. It might be a one-car family or no access at all. So they're riding the bus or taking a taxi to get their food um, to serve on the table every day. What that usually means is that they're more, families are more likely getting their food from corner stores, uh, you know, gas stations, uh, prepared microwave food, and um, you know, fast food restaurants. Uh, growing up, I didn't ever feel hungry, even though I was in a, a food desert and grew up in a, a family that was pretty poor. Uh, this is my mom. That's um, not one of us. That's our, her goat. Uh, she raised four boys on her own and even took in some, some foster children along the way, some of our you know, friends that were, uh, had lost their way. Um, we always had a garden in the backyard. Year round, uh, we always had some fresh produce, some fresh herbs growing that was supplementing um, our small income and what we were able, you know, my mom would buy uh, low cost staples from the grocery store, but we would supplement that with our fresh food uh, that was grown all naturally. And if we were to buy those kind of uh, similar organic products, there's no way we'd be able to afford it. Uh, we started Tower Urban Family Farm, or TUF for short. Um, in 2012, uh, led by my older brother Nolan, and it started with just three backyards um, within the neighborhood. This is Dudley Avenue off of Fulton where we grew up. Um, the one in the, the purple dot in the middle is uh, the, the house I grew up in. Um, what we decided to do, uh, led by Nolan, was to intensively garden every space possible in the yard. So think about any grass space any trees, any, um, 
you know, flowers that you have growing in your yard that you're irrigating, you're watering, think of that being replaced by edible foods, vegetables, herbs, fruits. Uh, and what we started doing was um, selling these fruits and vegetables to the neighborhood, you know, directly around us, uh, off the front porch, you know, taking direct deliveries to people, um, you know, elders and um, seniors in our neighborhood that weren't able to get around as much, we'd bring them deliveries, kind of like a CSA, um, and getting kids excited about eating fresh food. There was neighborhood kids that might be eating chips or whatever that we would give them tomatoes instead so that they're eating fresh food. Um, so that was the big idea of it. And then uh, an economic driver behind that. Um, these are uh, a group of kids that last, uh, this last summer had never eaten kiwi before. Kiwi is actually a, a crop that's grown in the valley. Um, and we identified a farm that has these misshaped larger kiwis that they can't take to market. So we are doing this kind of foraging where we come in and pick their kiwi that are too big for, for market. Um, and uh, what we're also doing, in addition to kind of serving the neighborhood, is we've got um, some several high-end and smaller local restaurants that we're selling produce directly to. So these are um, smaller restaurants that want the seasonally fresh, uh, locally grown produce. Um, but if they're to go to a large purveyor to buy this organic produce, um, they have to do it in a quantity that they can't keep long enough, um, or they're doing it at a, at a farmer's market where um, they're not getting wholesale prices, they're getting retail prices. Uh, this last year, um, this is our new farm map from last year, where we added some more properties. We had roughly an acre worth of, of land being farmed. Um, and we give, e give each site different names, like uh, there's one out at Moreau and Shields called the Homestead. Uh, the, right where uh, the neighborhood where I grew up, my mom's house, we called it Dry Creek Estates because it's right off the Dry Creek Canal. Um, there was a, an older woman, a senior, who had a house that was kind of like a tank house, like a water house, so we called that tank house. And then my house, I'm raising some rabbits, so we called it Fort Bunny. Uh, our main crop is, uh, is tomatoes, and um, so that's kind of our, our cash crop and what is really easy to to sell and people really see the difference between a conventionally grown tomato and a homegrown or you know a, a kind of naturally grown uh, a tomato. We aren't certified organic. That's there's. Um, I was asked to come and talk about urban farming as well as organic uh, agriculture, and we're not certified organic. And that's what certified organic means is a lot of um, you've kind of gone through the certification process and shown that all your inputs you're using are, are organic and that you're using all, all organic methods. Um, it's not really scaled in a way for our small scale farm for it to work out for us financially to become certified. So we just use all those organic product, products anyway um, and don't use any um, uh, unnatural uh, fertilizers and, and um, pesticides. Um, some of the other products we grow, um, we grow some unique stuff like lemon cucumbers. We try to to throw in kind of a different flair to our products that aren't just typically what you're seeing in the grocery store. So we want to show people different types of vegetables and show more diversity. So a lemon cucumber is about the size of a baseball. It's yellow, um, you cut into it. It's just like a cucumber on the inside um, and has a little bit of a different flavor than you know, your normal slicing cucumber. Um, another product that we grew last year, which um, was kind of an accident we had um, sometimes when you're gardening you'll have these things we call volunteers where a plant will just come up you didn't plant it there maybe somebody gardened there before that had it or it was a seed from your compost or whatever um, so I had a tiger melon plant pop up uh, tiger melon is about the size of a softball has orange and yellow stripes and is similar to um, kind of a mix between a honeydew and a cantaloupe um, so we grew that last year, collected all the seeds, and we're going up in production for that uh, this year. So we should be having a whole lot of tiger melons this year. And it's a nice kind of personal sized melon. You know, it's not as big as a cantaloupe that you don't really, you know, you lose half of it to waste or whatever. Uh, here's another sample of some of our, our vegetables, uh, eggplants, a um, couple different varieties of eggplant, lots of heirloom tomatoes, um, lots of peppers, habaneros, Fresno chilies. Um, are, are kind of our summer crops. 
Uh, we also have some like you know radishes and a, a mix of things, but these are our, our bulk of what we, we grow and sell. Uh, in the winter, uh, we're just now kind of getting into winter farming this last year and are going to be farming year round. Um, Russian red kale is one of our products. Uh, we do um, sugar snap peas and snow peas, uh, Brussels sprouts, um, and oranges. Uh, one thing we've started this year is what we're calling our urban orchard project. If you've, you know, I'm sure in your neighborhood you've seen orange trees or grapefruit trees where the fruit just sits on there until it falls off and it rots on the ground. Um, in, a, in a city where we have trouble with food security, that that's sees that as an opportunity for us to, to capture that. Uh, here's a look at just kind of some of our farm activity. Uh, through the neighborhood, we do a lot of transportation by bicycle, trying to avoid putting things in cars as much as possible so we're not um, you know, contributing with, with gas and greenhouse emissions. Uh, a lot of organic fertilizers and compost that we make, compost teas uh, that we, we make ourselves. Um, what we supplement is like Dr. Earth products is what we use for fertilizer or for pesticides. We use a product called Organicide, which is an organic um, uh, insecticide that has a lot of the oils and um, you know, seaweed and things like that. Here's uh, what we were doing for our farm stand. Um, working on change, like with this, we have to change local regulations to make these things legal, but we're not going to stop doing it because we see it as being important. So one of the things we're working to change is allowing farm stands in a neighborhood or allowing farmers markets to be easier to start up. Um, so this is my, my house where we kind of transform this you know, kind of blighted looking uh, parking garage area and then open it up to the garden space and put up a stand where we're selling produce to the, veg to the, to the neighborhood. Uh, this is, uh, County Supervisor Henry Perea is one of our customers, comes by regularly and buys tomatoes, uh, working with City Council and County Supervisors to adopt a new state law, which is called AB 551. Uh, it's an urban agricultural incentive zone, which is kind of modeled after uh, the Williamson Act, if you know some of the ag-related um, uh, incentives. That, so the incentive zone changes. If you have vacant urban land, you can change its property tax value from being residential or commercial to being agricultural, which lowers your, your tax burden. So that can help us get more land from landowners or when we, we've got plans to purchase our own land, that land then becomes easier to upkeep with taxes because the, the tax burden is lower. Uh, as my brother Nolan speaking to the Planning Commission when there was um, uh, an issue that came up about a text amendment to allow agriculture in the urban area, we've been working closely with the city and the planning department to allow um, urban agriculture on vacant land currently We've been only uh, farming land that has a house on it, which you can legally do as a home occupation. Home occupations in the city of Fresno zoning ordinance allow farming and farm management. So that's what we've been working under currently. Um, just a little snapshot of some of our urban orchard project, uh, pomegranates, oranges, grapefruits, or uh, uh, avocados, kiwi, uh, persimmons, all these things are growing in our neighborhood. We just have to harvest it and get it to people. So we're being that, that kind of conduit to get food to people. Uh, one other thing we do is these, farm, these kind of private farm to fork uh, meals to, to show people what e eating seasonal fresh food looks like from season to season, as well as kind of little fundraisers for our farm. We work either doing special outdoor events or working within some of our restaurant clients to do this. It's a duck tartlet with arugula. We've got you know, a kale summer mix salad. Uh, we've got a table made out of old bowling lanes from Cedar Lanes, that's our, our farm table. Um, so we're you know, really pushing this kind of reclaimed uh, material, really looking at what our waste is within a city and transforming that into something productive. Uh, here's our last meal. We did a brunch at Leela's restaurant. Uh, Lila's has been our longest client. Uh, my brother Nolan and, uh, and Manny Carr, the chef there, cooked together. Um, my brother moved from kind of a lifetime working in kitchens into doing farming, so we still have this close connection with, with local restaurants that's been helping us build our, our business. So like we had, for the, the brunch, we had mimosas, like uh, uh, citrus mimosas, grapefruit, and. Um, and oranges that were all urban harvested. Um, the arugula 
and spinach roulade with a French breakfast cream and a poached egg on top. The eggs, we, we work a lot with some of our alternative and or, uh, organic local farms like um, River Roots Farm out of Layton. They have a, an egg line called Just Got Laid Eggs. Um, and, you know, working closely with um, uh, Masamoto Farms, they're, you know, making friends with these alternative farmers and, and making these connections is really important for us. So a little chart of our growth um, from the, you know, the three years, two years that we've been operating and projected for this year. Uh, we just um, got a, a fringe property um, kind of in Clovis that has two acres that we're, we're farming from a, um, just as a gift from one of our farm supporters wants us to, to farm that land. So we're adding more land that we're growing this year, uh, incorporating more jobs, local jobs where we're training people that don't know how to farm or garden, how to, how to do that and have that skills. Um, this is a site in the Tower District, uh, is a, was a senior citizen that loved gardening, had all these wonderful trees in her yard, um, avocados and grapes and, um, and all this, uh, figs, but she couldn't garden anymore. She just wasn't physically able to do it, so we're farming for her on her land and she's able to come out and pick some things and do little things that she's still able to do, but we're, we're doing the bulk of the work, work for her. Uh, this is the, the fringe site that I was talking about um, at in Clovis. This was a, uh, a sprinkler irrigated pasture space in a, a larger lot um, that we're then taking to be row crops by drip irrigation, which dramatically reduces the amount of water used. So we're, we're able to produce food on that land for less water than was just spraying grass. Um, a lot of our work is just, a, we get volunteers come out. It's a lot of manual labor. Um, on smaller space, you can't really do as much mechanization um, that you can do on a larger farm. Um, so it becomes this kind of workout. Uh, here's kind of a look at what we've got sprouting right now. We're doing a, a sprout sale um, at our farm stand, next, not this Saturday, next Saturday, the, the 29th, um, where we're selling some of the extra plants that we sprouted to, um, to the neighborhood to grow their own gardens. This is arugula, uh, romaine lettuce, and then several thousand tomato plants and eggplants that we have started um, at a greenhouse at Fresno State. Um, and again, drip irrigation, everything we do is drip irrigation to really fine tune the water usage. Um, these are some peas that I grew this, um, this winter and I wanted to we'll pass something around for you guys. Um, well, snap peas and snow peas um, from the start, you know, sprouting out of the ground, flowers that was, uh, you know, kind of dampened by the rain, the pea on the plant, and then picking it, pick these this morning. Uh, one thing about fresh vegetables is their, their nutrients in there degrade pretty fast. Uh, I believe it's about within 72 hours, 50% of the nutrients in a fresh vegetable has degraded and you don't get it when you eat it anymore. Um, so by eating plant as soon as it's, you know, close to when it's picked as possible, you get more nutrients, more, um, more of that beneficial um, stuff for your body. Uh, this is my brother Jordan, my younger brother, with our, our beast of a rototiller uh, when we started my garden. Um, and just, it's a lot of kind of hard work and just keeping the turn earth and adding more ground to our, to our farm every year. Um, and I haven't updated our map yet. We'll probably be doing a new map this spring to show more of the space within the, the city that we're growing. Um, and that's, that's the story of our farm. All right, next we're going to have uh, Doug Patterson uh, talk for uh, just a, a moment to let us know a little bit about what he does. So let me give you a little bit of background about him. He supervises the water con uh, quality control um, no, I'm sorry, he is a water control <laughs> engineer at the Southern San Joaquin Valley Office of the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree from Fresno State in Civil Engineering, and he's been working for the board for 21 years. And I asked him to briefly give us a little bit of background of what he does for us to make sure that our water is safe. Thank you. Thanks. 
I, I work for the Regional Water Quality Control Board. There are nine regional water boards throughout the state. Uh, the umbrella agency is the State Water Resources Control Board. And, it, and the mission of the water boards in general is to preserve and enhance the quality of water for future and present, or present and future generations. And we do that, we're a permitting agency. Um, the State Water Board oversees water quality issues that have statewide significance. It also um, regulates water rights. Uh, the Department of Water Resources is responsible for water supply and, and making sure that water is distributed around the state. Um, the water boards are responsible for protecting the quality of the resource, the water resource, both surface water and groundwater. So there's the state water board, like I say, is an umbrella agency, and it, it sets statewide policy. It also uh, reviews appeals of regional board action. There's, I believe, seven full-time state water board members who are appointed by the governor. Um, there's also seven each regional board has seven board members who are part-time members appointed by the governor. They meet usually 10 times a year. And each region is guided by what are called basin plans, which are, which are plans adopted by the boards to protect the water resource in that region or in that area of a region. Uh, the Central Valley region, which is the region I work for, is the largest in the state. We cover about 40% of the area of California, from the Oregon border down to the grapevine within the boundaries of the coast range in the Sierra Nevadas. And so we have three basin plans, or two, three basins, two basin plans. One plan is for the Sacramento San Joaquin River basins and then there's a basin plan for the Tulare Lake Basin, which is the southern San Joaquin Valley. And so basin plans contain listing of all the water bodies within that basin. Uh, it assigns what are called beneficial uses to each of those water bodies, such as drinking water, agriculture, industrial uses. And then it specifies water quality objectives, which are numerical or narrative limits that that water that each water body needs to achieve to be suitable for a particular beneficial use. And so we implement the basin plans through adopting permits, which we call waste discharge requirements. And those are the permits for protecting water quality from discharges of waste. And that's essentially what we regulate is waste discharges from a variety of sources from municipal wastewater treatment plants to industrial facilities um, and including agriculture and confined animal facilities or dairies. And so that's pretty much what I do. Okay, great. Let me, uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, we now have the opportunity, thank you. We now have the opportunity to ask questions of our panel members. I just want to remind the audience that we're not here to debate issues or give our opinion. We're here to ask questions and, and learn from our panel experts. And I saw a hand way in the back there. I'm not a historian, but I, the first regulation for pesticide use in the United States goes back to about 1900. Um, the actual, as far as regulation goes, um, it's been the, I think, the FIFRA Act uh, was incorporated around just post-World War II, and then the uh, EPA picked up and refined it in 1971. But pesticides have been one form or another have pretty much been in agriculture as far back as any of us can look at it as an industrial uh, product, you know, producing food for other places, keep controlling pests of all sorts. Um, I can't give you an exact date, but it's modern, modern farming has had pesticide use for a long, long, long time. I hope that answers your question. 
and even um, organic farming uses pesticides as well. It's just there's organic, um, uh, you know, chemistries to those or natural origins to, to those products. Such as what? Nicotine. Uh, nicotine, different oils. I think mint oil was mentioned. Seaweeds are um, things that are used. Tobacco is um, a natural uh, pesticide. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that, I mean, we should probably look very closely at what we incentivize. Like if you look at uh, the farm bill, there's a lot of incentives for certain types of agriculture. A lot of those are commodities that are exported. Um, and we should, we should look at if that's the best use of federal money and federal subsidy. Is it exporting food for, for the profit of some larger corporations? Or is it... Um, helping support small, uh, you know, family-owned run farms to, to help feed our, our country. Sure. Um, animal waste is regulated by the water boards. There's a general order that requires all dairies to manage and treat and or treat their waste to protect the environment through uh, proper drainage and storage so that water doesn't accumulate and, and come in contact with waste, pick up constituents and get into the water, and also requires uh, nutrient management so that manure is applied to croplands at rates and at times that the crops can actually use it and tries to minimize the amount that would percolate beyond the root zone and get to groundwater. Yeah, I think that, that's a great question and that's one of the things about um, the dairies in the Central Valley, one of the reasons they're here is because dairy cows are great recyclers. So the leftover carrots, the leftover pomegranates, the leftover, um, you know, lots of cotton seed, um, almond hulls, all those um, are fed to dairy cattle. And then uh, the great thing is, as Doug mentioned, the, the um, dairies are required to have lagoons, to have treat the waste, to monitor the waste. One of the, dri the driving factors for the consolidation, why we don't have very many 50 cow dairies anymore, is the environmental regulations that the, the dairies hire professionals to come in and measure their lagoon every month to, to work with um, how much manure is being being applied to each little um, plot of land, um, whether they're growing corn there, whether they're growing cotton, or whether they're growing alfalfa, wheat, whatever, all of that, they look at, you know, what's the amount of uh, nutrients that are in those plants, and then what are the amount of nutrients that they're applying, and they have to um, abide by the rules and keep everything straight. So um, it's, it's a great thing how integrated um, animal agriculture is with all the products here in the Central Valley. Yeah, as, as probably most people are aware, nitrates are a, a serious issue in the Central Valley, or especially in the Tulare Lake Basin, and impacted people's drinking water supplies. State your question one more time. I was wondering if the U.S. Uh, the, you have any cooperation with the USDA entomologists? I we don't. Um, that would be something more on the research side. 
uh, pesticide manufacturers and developers do work have very tightly with the, the USDA and uh, EPA in development of new uh, chemistries. Um, but as far as what my office does, I regulate what they decide to pass. So uh, the USDA is a federal level entity and they, but they do work closely with manufacturers and uh, uh, implementing new chemistry and, and developing new uh, applications. Great question. Um, our office has two investigators um, on top of our staff of approximately 35 inspectors. Um, if we are either reported or observe a violation, uh, we do an investigation. We may, we will go through, we may, may take samples, we may take pictures to reinforce uh, and find out if a violation has taken place. And if a violation can be proved, proven, we will take an action in the form of what's called a notice of violation, which will uh, get is a written information saying you, we say you have violated or broken this law. And if it's serious enough, we may take a notice of proposed action which means that they will receive a fine. Um, on top of that, we, depending on what the violation incurs, whether it was a worker health and safety uh, issue where a worker was endangered or other people were endangered, um, that influences how the fines are in influenced. Uh, the commissioner has the ultimate choice on what level he wants to fine the person on. Um, but we also look to see what crops are involved. Uh, was a improper application made to a commodity and that commodity may be in put out to uh, for sale um, we have had to confiscate and destroy crops because of improper uh, applications um, we've had growers who have lost significant amounts of crop due to improper applications or and or residues um, sometimes we get information from Department of Pesticide Regulation because they do the sampling. Um, Department of Pesticide Regulation has folks that actually go out to the distributors. They try not to catch them in the stores. They actually go to the distributor level, which is as close as you can get to the grower as you can, and do random sampling looking for illegal residues. And if they get an illegal residue, they report it to us and we follow up on it and follow that same procedure of investigation uh, we may put something on what we call a red tag or a hold and find out if that uh, residue is still there and find out what caused it and take action from there. There's, there's, we're studying that right now. Um, there's what's called a representative groundwater monitoring program that is evaluating operations, uh, practices at various dairies throughout the region as well as various representative soil and geologic conditions throughout the region and, and putting groundwater monitoring around those to evaluate whether or not current management practices are effective at preventing, at protecting groundwater quality. Uh, currently, I, I forget the exact number, 95 or more percent of the dairies in the region are members of this representative monitoring program so that the results from those dairies that are monitored, the representative dairies, would then be extrapolated to all dairies in the program. And so that if, if a particular practice is found to be not protective or if certain 
liner, you know, lagoon liner design is not protective under certain soil conditions, then other dairies that have those same conditions would be required to upgrade their systems. One more question. Um, for Mr. Griffin, um, actually, my previous question was, what, if not petrochemical chemicals, what is the base of, uh, base material of the newer chemical, chemistry? And also, you did not mention anything about fertilizer. Is that not within your purview? And if it's not within yours, who monitors um, uh, fertilizer? Let me tackle the fertilizer one first. Um, we have no laws or regulations currently that do anything with fertilizers. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean that it will be that way forever. Um, but as of right now, there is nothing in the Food, Ag, or, County Co or California Code of Regulations that monitors or deals with fertilizer applications. Um, our water friend down here might know more about that because they do monitor nitrogens and phosphates. Um, I don't know if you've noticed lately, but it's just, just my observation. If you go and look at your uh, local hardware store to buy your fertilizers, especially lawn fertilizers, um, they have dropped the phosphorus levels extremely low. Some of them don't have any anymore. Um, mostly it's nitrogen now, but uh, the phosphorus has dropped way off because they were finding too much was in runoff. But I'll let, uh, let him address that. Sure. The, the, the dairy, dairy general order that I spoke of was adopted in 2007. Just last year, the Regional Water Board adopted an order to regulate irrigated agriculture, and one of the major components of that is requirement for nutri nutrient management planning so that fertilizers, whether they be uh, manufactured or manure are applied at agronomic rates uh, to minimize again the percolation of uh, percolation or runoff of, of nutrients to the water supply. And s Can I touch on one? I know there's a live really can't cite whether it's federal or state going through about using non-composted uh, animal manure for uh, as a fertilizer that there is a they're proposing a waiting period of like uh, four or six months where if you're applying a non-composted manure like manure directly from an animal to the ground that you can't grow in or harvest from that within six months and that's I believe that's targeted a roost amount of like E. coli and, and salmonella contamination in, and that's that affects more organic farms because organic farms use a lot of a lot of manure for fertilizers. But the petrochemically based fertilizers are not monitored. Not through our office. Um, doesn't doesn't mean that they're not looked at. It just means we have no we have no enforcement actions on fertilizers at all right now. I have no idea. It would probably be something more on the EPA level than the federal level than the local. Um, I know there was a lot of concern with uh, some of the fertilizers because of the some of the actions that were taken, you know, making bombs and stuff out of them. Um, but that was nothing ever came of it that I'm aware of. So we do not regulate fertilizer use. The other question, um, the new chemistries, I'm not a chemist, but I do know they've changed their modes of action tremendously. Um, a lot of the old, uh, I'm blanking now, um, carbamates, uh, a lot of the systems, the, the stuff that used to really be harmful, um, are just there, some of them aren't even being registered anymore. Uh, a lot of the newer chemistry, some of you might have heard of what's called neonicotinoids. Um, they're, those are the materials that were, that's a nicotine derivative that was banned in the European Union for B, because of B issues. Um, that's an experiment that's, they're seeing if it makes any difference. Um, been a lot of concern about, you know, colony collapse in bees. Uh, what the sources are for those is up to debate. Um, a lot of it's being blamed on the pesticide industry. Uh, pesticide industry is saying it's not all us. Um, they're not faultless, but they're, 
they're saying it's not all them. There's a lot of other issues that are happening. So lack of loss of habitat and other influences. So there's a lot going on with that. But uh, like I say, uh, the neonicotinoids are the most popular one right now as far as new, newer chemistry. That's the same materials that you put on your pets for flea control. You, know, you put the little bit on their neck and they, that's a, a, what they call a neonicotinoid. It's a nicotine derivatives. Um, yeah, it's, it's used at very low rates and you do see it uh, used on production agriculture quite a bit. Um, and as far as I know, it's, it's a very, very low toxicity material to humans. Um, but that's, that's the number one that I can say as far as new on the scene. Um, uh, beyond that, I, I would have to do a little more research. But it, the, just the general use of heavy toxic materials, long-lasting environmental materials, have dropped off considerably. A lot of the restricted materials in California aren't even, I've got a list of probably about 70 materials and probably 35 of them aren't even registered in the state right now. Um, so they're just, they're dropping off at a, at a really rapid rate. Part of it's due to regulation, part of it's just due to better chemistry out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just one more quick question. I, uh, just to address what he was saying about the organics, um, Thank you for saying that the organic growers use, do use some insecticides, and they do. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I, I don't care either way. Um, just some people think organic means no pesticide. And I just, to educate everyone, means that you can use pesticides. It means they're organically registered materials, much softer chemistries, much lower toxicities, less residues, that kind of information. So just keep that in the back of your mind. I like, I use organic stuff just in, or buy organic food just as much as anybody else. But some people think the automatic is organic means no use at all and that's not necessarily true. So just to keep that clear. Okay, how about a round for our panel experts? On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Fresno, I would like to thank our, our panel experts, our audience, and our viewing audience um, today. And I want to invite everyone to visit our website at fresno.ca.lwvnet.org, where we have a vast amount of reading materials on agriculture. I'd like, like to also invite anyone, men or women, who would like to be a member of the League of Women Voters. We are going to be doing that national study on March 29th at Stone Soup, and I hope to see some new faces there. Thank you for viewing today. Thank you.